data or micro data, some reports that you will get from uh, companies uh, and so on. And of course, when you set up all of this, the ultimate goal is somehow to, to publish your data, either let's say in, fully internally for your policy makers or even publicly. So this is something, of course, it, here it's put at the end, but that's something, of course, that you consider since the beginning, depending on you know, what is really your aim, you may have to consider um, uh, let's say deepening the data sources or identify more data sources to answer the user needs. So if we move now to the other accounts, this environmental subsidy and similar transfers uh, accounts. So here, as I said um, in introduction, we, we are only focusing on kind of the green subsidies, not the brown one with this account. So here we rely uh, really on the um, uh, distributive transactions set in the um, national accounts methodology. So you have, uh, we have identified four kind of uh, taxes. So these three are the subsidies. Uh, these six are these uh, social contribution and, and benefits, which may be very low uh, in many countries. So some countries, it's a, it, they are not identified as such because they are really, really uh, small compared to the overall uh, subsidies and similar transfers. Then you have uh, D7, which are the current transfers, and D9, the capital transfers. So here we are interested in looking where it goes from the general government or the rest of the world to our national economies and the rest of the world as well. And in terms of national economies, I think it's quite key to, to have the information by institutional sector. So whether they are corporation, household, NPH, or government. Uh, from the rest of the world, in some countries, it may be, let's say, really nothing or even not existing. In the EU, we have many EU funds, um, subsidies, and similar transfers. So it's quite important for us. And you will see <clears throat> at the end that there are some countries where it's really a big part of their um, subsidies received uh, from, yeah, from outside some more. The unit of observation that we have identified here, they are institutional units or grouping of units. And the definition here, again, it's aligned with the national accounts. And we have um, the transfer categorized along this, uh, let's say, this distribution uh, transaction that I have uh, uh, noted here, so current transfer, capital transfers, and a little bit more detail inside. Of course, we are interested in knowing um, for which kind of environmental uh, areas, which kind of environmental uh, goal you are, let's say, providing subsidies to some recipients, and then to know which activities are the recipients uh, working. So here again, when you look at uh, trying to set up uh, a first approach to measure these environmental transfers, I think one statistic that is quite uh, important and uh, maybe easy to use, but not um, most of the time not enough, they are these uh, government statistics where they use the, the, the COFOG classification. So you have in this COFOG classification, okay, uh, some uh, division uh, for environmental protection, but of course there are maybe others that are related, let's say, and indirectly to to the environmental uh, policy you are looking at. You have to go more deeper than just, let's say, the government statistic data. So you have to analyze many budget lines. Uh, I've seen recently uh, Germany that they, they had to analyze like 12,000 of budget lines, you know, to identify which uh, transfer subsidies uh, needs to be looked at. You may profit from uh, what you have set already uh, as uh, data compilation, uh, collection for this protection of expenditure accounts. So this is something that goes somehow end in end with the uh, uh, transfers and subsidies. And here again, you know, you may have this issue of um, splitting your subsidies into different environmental areas. So you may have data, you may not. And there is this real marker approach to somehow to, to have a really a FUB estimate how much you should put there. And I think what is quite important in, in terms of subsidies, indeed, is to know which industry receives the subsidies. So this is for you to judge, you know, how far you can go with this kind of information. In practice, in EU, so we have a EU regulation. Uh, I think in this sense, we are quite lucky. 
Um, for environmental taxes, this is a mandatory data set. So we have 35 countries reporting for a long time series now. And we have quite, let's say, a short deadline, I would say, for annual data, T plus 16 months. Um, we have data broken down by 64 activities. For subsidies here, this is still a voluntary uh, data collection, which should go into mandatory in uh, two or three years. So for now, we have only 14 countries reporting. The time series is shorter. Uh, we have a longer timeliness, two years after the, the period. And uh, here as well, in number of activities, we focus only on the 10 main uh, broaden activities. Yes, so this is my, my uh, yeah, almost last slide. So here is some data. On the left, you have the taxes, environmental tax revenues by type. And you can see, let's say, this uh, bottom part is energy taxes. So at EU level, this is really the, the main um, uh, tax that, we, that we have for EU. And on the left side, you have some data for the similar transfers and subsidies. And here you can see, for example, for Bulgaria, so the first on the left, and Romania, this uh, oh, see, pink color code, color column, here is what comes from the rest of the world. So you can see that for those two countries, you have a lot of EU funds and uh, then subsidies coming from the rest of the world. And my last slide. So you, you can know more looking at uh, the Eurostat database. So we have data on, on those uh, two accounts. You have as well some articles, especially for the taxi sports. We are working on an article for the subsidy that should come in, out in May. And you have all the material regarding the questionnaires and the methodological guidelines on the website. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Isabel, for this presentation on a very sound and well-established uh, methodology on environmental taxes and um, environmental-friendly subsidies and transfers. I think it gives some good overview and a good start. And um, now we have Claire from UNEP. Um, she will present on fossil fuel subsidies and SDG reporting. Claire is an economist with a focus on public finance and green fiscal policies. She works for the Economic and Trade Policy Unit at the UN Environmental Program. She previously worked with UNDP, the Asian Development Bank, and as an advisor to the Ministry of Finance of Timor-Leste. She's currently based in Sweden. So, um, Claire, you have 15 minutes, and even though it's a bit rude, I'll tell you three minutes before the end, yeah? So just, you know. So the floor is yours, please. No problem, that's quite acceptable. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, uh, offering us this opportunity to speak. Um, so, yeah, I will um, uh, try to, this morning, give a bit of an overview of how uh, this topic of fossil fuel subsidies and the different measurements that exist fits under the SDG framework. Um, so, just a brief um, overview of this presentation. Um, yeah, we will. I'll, I'll first give an overview of the, the different types of uh, measurements that exist um, and how uh, we try to bring them together under this uh, this SDG framework, and in particular the SDG indicator 12C1, which is the one we're interested in today. Uh, I'll give a brief summary of the current state of reporting, and finally I'll um, uh, try to link this back to the CI and how to connect this to uh, the SDG indicator we're interested in. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, my mouse is going out of control. Right, so maybe just to put everyone on the same page, uh, you might all be familiar with this already, but um, under the SDG framework 2030, um, an SDG indicator and target was added related to the rationalization of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So that's under um, SDG 12, which is on sustainable consumption and production. And in particular, the target 12C, which is about the rationalization of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. And um, going down now to the indicator itself, at hashes target, um, which is meant to measure the, the progress on this target, um, which is the amount of fossil fuel subsidies, production and consumption. Um, I'll say a bit more about that later, uh, per unit of GDP. 
So um, when this target was added to the um, to the SDG framework in 2015, um, there was no at this stage there was no um, global methodology for the measure of fossil fuel subsidies, nor was there a definition and a grid definition worldwide of uh, fossil fuel subsidy. So before I go into um, the indicator itself, maybe just a quick reminder of um, why it is that we measure fossil fuel subsidies, um, uh, as was uh, mentioned by the, the, the colleague from uh, Eurostat before, um, ultimately we want to remember why uh, why these, <laughs> this data is collected and how it can be used by policymakers. Um, so maybe on, 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 this, on, on this one, Apart from, of course, the, giving us the capacity to track progress on, on this target of rationalizing fossil fuel subsidies, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Um, two key points for, for, um, for this topic. First, um, this is a way to measure the fiscal cost of those measures, uh, which is often huge uh, to an extent that governments might not be entirely aware. Um, this is particularly true for measures like tax tax breaks um, or any other forms of revenue that um, the government uh, gives up on. Um, and it is tricky to estimate, um, but um, it's something to keep in mind, especially in the recent context, which um, has led quite a few countries to either introduce new fossil fuel subsidies in view of the um, skyrocketing prices of energy, or at least to explore options to do so. Um, and uh, yeah, many governments aren't aware of the entire budget cost of the subsidies, and that can truly be a, a pretty powerful motivator for reform. So I think that's a, that's a key point to, to have in mind. And the other, um, the other aspect I want to, to emphasize is, um, of course, this is, this is a form of reform that is quite politically sensitive. Um, it's, it's quite delicate to be in place. Um, and in particular, the part where we want to make this um, a, a fair, a socially fair reform. Um, and for that, we need to include a number of safety net measures to, to limit the short-term impacts um, on not only the poorest, uh, most vulnerable population, but also on the most impacted industries. Um, there's also the risk of social backlash to be taken into account. Um, uh, we know that we, we have quite a few examples of governments uh, attempting to reform the energy taxation system without necessarily putting in, part, in, part in place sorry, the, the mitigation measures that, that were needed. So all of this to keep in mind that um, ultimately we want to understand uh, quite in-depthly the, 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 the existing um, uh, energy energy support system in order to feed into the design of a reform that's appropriate. So we need to understand who receives the subsidies, how it impacts um, households, companies, um, what are the social impact, what are the economic impacts of the subsidies in order to design um, an appropriate reform. Now, um, so there are quite a few uh, databases that estimates um, the amount of fossil fuel subsidies at global or regional level or national level. Um, uh, I've, I've provided a few here, but there are actually a few more. Uh, of course, we have the OECD inventory. Um, that is an, a really excellent source of, of, of data for um, not only OECD countries now, they I think they cover uh, almost over 80 countries, if I'm not mistaken. I guess uh, as Sarah is connected, so she can tell us more about that later. Um, but of course, we have the International Aid Energy Agency. Uh, the AMF also produces um, uh, regular, regularly estimated at global level. Um, uh, quite a few countries now are starting to produce and publish uh, estimates. I gave the, the example of um, the Republic of Ireland here, um, uh, who, publish, who publishes data on their website annually. Um, so, without listing them all, um, uh, yeah, there's really uh, uh, more and more scrutiny and progress on the measure of fossil fuel subsidies, which is great news, uh, with perhaps just two caveats. Uh, the first one being that, and we'll say more about that in a second, all of these estimates use different methodologies, different geographical scopes, which means they're not necessarily, uh, they, they can be complementary, but they're not necessarily comparable. And as a result, we do have Quite a few gaps that remain, especially at national levels, um, for countries that might not be covered, for example, by the OECD inventory, 
um, and yeah, in particular, in particular, in monolithic countries that um, where there needs to be more um, capacity building in statistical offices, um, and in those countries, fossil fuel subsidies sometimes represent huge amount of of the GDP and really need to be addressed. So yeah, this uh, this absence of this absence of data can really be problematic. Now, uh, I mentioned that there were a few differences uh, in, in methodologies for measuring fossil fuel subsidies between those different estimates. Um, I gave a few examples here. So, of course, um, there's yeah, difference, uh, in differences in the instruments used. Um, the main two being, on the one hand, the price gap approach. That's the one used by the International Energy Agency and the AMF, um, which aims to, to quantify the, the difference between the price set by the government um, compared to what would be the price in the competitive market. Um, and so that, that difference is, is considered to be the amount of subsidy provided um, uh, as, a, as a price support measure. Uh, we have the, invent and on the other hand, we can take an inventory um, approach, which is of course the one taken by the OECD, but also by quite a few countries, um, in which case um, we aim to list and quantify um, the entire list of, of measures in place. And this, this approach is really useful to get a clear picture of the types of measures that are in place um, uh, directly on the ground. Um, we, there's also a differentiation. So moving away from the, the difference of methodologies, um, uh, there, there is also a differentiation to be made between the, the targets, the recipients of the subsidies. So for example, the AEA, um, asset, uh, the AEA estimate will only look at consumer subsidies, um, whereas the OECD inventory will look at both consumer and producer subsidies. There can be also differences in the coverage. Um, uh, how far do you go in, for example, in the industries that you include, do you stop at um, uh, fossil fuel uh, producing industries or do you also include um, uh, fossil fuel uh, intensive industry like plastic? So all of these, um, can differ um, depending on, on who produces the estimate. And so it's in this context that the, the, there was a need for this institute indicator to develop a methodology that would sort of um, bring together and put everyone at the same level for the, the reporting on, on the SDG 12C1 indicator. So this methodology was uh, developed by UNEP, ISD and, and OECD. Um, and yeah, again, the idea was really to, to get everyone um, uh, at the same level with a, a shared definition of fossil fuel subsidies, um, a shared um, uh, approach of the scope of what, what is considered, what is not considered a subsidy. Um, I probably won't have, I won't have time to go into the detail of this, but in any case, I think this is not really the point here today. Um, maybe just um, to briefly say that uh, on the, the choice that was made on the, the definition of the fossil fuel subsidy, um, we decided to go with, on the one hand, the definition of fossil fuel by the IEA, which is in the statistical manual, and for subsidy, uh, we aligned with, uh, like many others, the WTO definition, which is quite widely accepted. Now, when it comes to the list of subsidies that's being reported, um, so the, the following this WTO definition, the methodology identified for um, direct transfers of government funds. Uh, so that's direct spending usually appears on national budgets. It's fairly easy to track and, and monitor. Um, induced transfers, press reports, um, that refers to um, what can be measured through the price gap methodology that I was mentioning, um, that the IEA, for example, applies. Um, and so that, that's either through um, market regulations or border protection, like tariff measures. It can be done through uh, price regulation mechanisms. Um, third being tax expenditure. So any form of tax breaks, tax exemptions, or any other form of foregone revenue, um, for example, underpricing of, um, of government services, infrastructure, um, and the last one being transfer of risk to government. Um, I should mention that the first two are considered compulsory in the reporting, while uh, tax expenditure is considered, is highly recommended, but optional, um, as the data collection process is a bit more, um, in, let's say, in progress on this one. And the last one, transfer of risk to government, this one is actually not recommended, um, because yeah, it was estimated at the time of 
the development of the methodology that the data availability was not sufficient for this one. Of course, this is subject to revisions of future as um, national statistics offices, you know, build up um, their, their, their databases. Um, just a quick uh, note in the last few minutes on the current state of reporting. Um, so just maybe to give a, say a few words about the, the, the process of reporting. So the way we do, we function is that we go through SDG focal points at national levels. Um, so each uh, government, each statistical office is asked to uh, nominate a possible a subsidy, apologies, a, an indicator 12C1. Claire, you have three minutes left, sorry. Noted, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, we will go through this SDG focal point to collect the data. Um, the first data drive took place last year. Uh, sorry, yes, 2022, yes, took place last year. Um, and so the number of, report of countries that reported was fairly low, which is not which is not extremely surprising as this was the first data drive. Um, but so we had 11 countries that submitted the, the questionnaire back. Um, but let's say that among those only six countries had what we could consider to be a fairly complete reporting. Um, and quite a few countries actually indicated that they were preparing the data, but requested for a time extension. And a few countries also indicated that they would submit, but through um, through the OCD. So we are expecting um, a, a rising number for this year. But something that came out is that um, we do need to continue um, um, capacity building um, activities in in quite a few uh, regions. Um, quite a few countries really did uh, sort of start from scratch on this indicator. They didn't have any preliminary uh, existing data. Um, so they, they, it is, it is expecting that it will take a few years to to build up. Um, I should mention that here, um, the global estimates by fuel type that I indicated, that's taken from um, a really useful platform um, that is uh, managed by the US, by the OECD and IASD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, that combines the existing sources uh, on fossil fuel subsidies, and the idea here is that. Um, Progressively, as um, national databases on fossil fuel subsidies build up and, and as the reporting on this strategy improves, we will progressively replace uh, these global estimates for international organization sources with national level data. Uh, given that I only have one minute left, I'll just uh, very quickly go over uh, this last slide. Um, simply to say that there is um, there is quite a, a number of existing databases, um, either through the ones I mentioned, but also um, through existing CIA, um, uh, CIA uh, databases, and those can uh, those can provide inputs and um, answer to quite a few of the data gaps existing for this indicator. Um, and yeah, in view of the limited time, I'll just uh, refer you to this really really useful and excellent. Um, paper that was uh, produced uh, in 2018 on um, how the, the linking can be done between between CI and the SDG reporting. Um, this being said, I think there's an agreement that more conversations will be needed in the future. I'll stop here um, providing some resources and uh, happy to take the floor if there are any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, uh, for this good overview of the methodology. So just an information, we'll take questions for all three talks right after uh, the next one, which is closely related. So Claire, please stay with us. I'm, I'm sure there will be some back uh, questions. So we continue with exactly the same topic with, um, I think, yeah, I'm mean, <laughs> curious to hear more about it. So um, it is given by Sarah Mead from OECD. So she will talk on, um, Guidance on Measuring Fossil Fuel Subsidies, Updates on OECD Work. Sarah is a statistician and junior policy analyst, analyst working on environmental information and indicators. She manages the OECD Environment at a Glance platform, works on the OECD inventory of support measures to fossil fuels, and on country environmental performance reviews. So again, you have 50 minutes, and I'll tell you three minutes before the end. The floor is yours. We cannot hear you yet. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Okay. Um, you are unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Now? Now, yes. Can you hear me? Okay, so sorry. I'm going to... But you are... Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, now it works. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be to go a little bit uh, further uh, on what and elaborate a bit more on what Claire said actually on um, OECD work on uh, measuring fossil fuel support. Um, so I'm going to develop uh, a bit more the inventory approach. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, uh, as Claire said, um, we have been measuring uh, support measures for fossil fuel since 2010. Um, adopting the inventory approach for 51 countries. Uh, so these are some resources on the uh, accompanying country notes uh, and report, uh, companion report to the inventory that we produce every two years. And these data uh, are used in several OECD and other international uh, fora such, such as the G20 uh, and APEC uh, peer reviews. Um, I'll go quickly through some of the slides, uh, as Claire already mentioned, some of, of the issue. But um, so the uh, main purpose uh, of inventory is really to direct and inform uh, reform strategies. And therefore, um, inventories uh, provide government with a list of measures that are potential candidates for reform. They do not judge on the um, on the objective of the measure and whether they are appropriate, uh, this is a second order task. Um, and um, to allow government to track and evaluate uh, individual support measures. Uh, so in that sense, inventory um, should be as comprehensive as possible and have uh, enough detail uh, for policy and anal analytical purposes. And ideally, uh, inventory data should also uh, lend themselves uh, to being used for several purposes. And actually, uh, inventories, uh, inventory data uh, can be a very rich source uh, for official statistics and accounts and for deriving uh, many uh, subsidy related indicators. So, um, producing, as Claire already mentioned, uh, producing data on fossil fuel subsidies goes with a number of measurement challenges uh, that range from uh, institutional arrangements in countries. Uh, for example, for the SDG reporting, as you mentioned, uh, the data are collecting from national statistical offices. For the inventory, uh, OECD inventory, um, we have contact with uh, ministries of finance, um, rather. There are also some um, differences in definitions and measurement methods adopted by countries. There is no universal agreement uh, on the measures that constitute a subsidies and how to estimate their monetary values. And as a result, uh, international databases and fossil fuel subsidies have a varying uh, and incomplete coverage. So these issues uh, have already been raised, uh, for example, in the, uh, as was also mentioned by Claire, the London Group uh, on Environmental uh, Accounting, but also on the um, inter-agency and expert group on SDG indicators and in several OECD meetings, and therefore the OECD uh, informal task team on uh, measuring fossil fuel subsidies. So uh, this task team uh, was mandated to assist the Secretariat in improving the quality uh, and international comparability of the data and indicators which, which are derived uh, from the OECD inventories and also to exploit synergies with the reporting uh, to the SDG uh, 12C1. So, uh, and the main purpose of my presentation is that, uh, so discussions uh, is to provide you with uh, some results on the discussions of this ITT, uh, which resulted in the proposal to develop uh, some practical guidance notes uh, to address uh, these measurement issues and also provide concrete recommendation uh, for improving the quality of the data and the related uh, collection processes. <clears throat> so very quick overview of uh, the content of this guidance notes, which uh, includes among others, um, a clarification, guidance on how to uh, set up an inventory and how to estimate uh, the support measures that are included. 
um, this guidance note pay, pays particular attention to uh, tax expenditures and the benchmarking of tax rates, uh, which is uh, st still uh, have uh, measurement challenges. Um, and the guidance also um, uh, talk about how to improve data collection and harmonization, including synergies uh, with the CE. So on the definition, as Claire mentioned, uh, the OECD inventory uh, is aligned with the SDG uh, definition uh, and adopt the W definition of a subsidy. Um, then uh, it breaks down uh, the subsidy um, by type of policy instruments, so uh, direct transfer, induced transfer, tax expenditure, and transfer of risk. Then also to the target uh, of the subsidy. Uh, so there is a, a breakdown by the at the in the OECD inventory on the production and consumption side of the market, which can be uh, further broken down uh, along the value chain. Um, so again, um, the the measure included in the inventory um, are not um, designed to assess whether a measure is justified or not, but provide um, a pool of measure that uh, could be a prioritized for reform. And so when delimiting the scope uh, of reporting of an, an, of an inventory, um, so any government measure that may confer an absolute uh, or relative benefit or preference for the production or consumption of fossil fuel should be considered a state. So this scope is very extended uh, to help um, provide data that can be used for several purposes. But of course, this needs to be balanced uh, against added complexity uh, of collecting such data and the resource requirements uh, in involved. So in order to adopt a pragmatic approach, um, which is also incremental, the guidance note uh, recommends that the scope of reporting builds on existing data uh, and focus uh, on uh, enhancing the coverage and quality uh, of this data. So, as you see, this is an illustration of uh, what I, I said. Well, the definition aims to cast a wide net and encompass, encompass all measures that provide benefits to uh, fossil fuel production or consumption. In reality, uh, what is actually collected uh, is uh, mainly direct transfer, induced transfer, and tax expenditures. And that's the um, measurement of this data that uh, we would like to improve uh, as a first step. So, in particular, the case of uh, tax expenditure is relevant for OECD countries, which provide uh, most of their uh, support to fossil fuels in the form of uh, tax expenditures. But, for example, only 26 out of the 24 um, OECD and G20 economies uh, included in the OECD inventory uh, produce tax expenditure reports uh, that record the revenue foregone from uh, providing tax benefits. Um, so there, uh, there is a, a lot of data gaps uh, remaining in the tax expenditure data. The most reported ones are reductions and exemptions to uh, consumer taxes, and in that category, uh, mainly fuel excise taxes. There are the corporate income tax system uh, and at some national level. And uh, there are interpretation challenges, uh, in particular for variations uh, across countries and over time. Um, this is because tax incentives, uh, as you know, are, are defined uh, in relation to a country's uh, standard tax systems, tax system. And therefore, uh, even uh, small deviations from uh, high benchmark rates uh, translate into large amounts uh, of support. And also because baseline rates, uh, terms, or eligibility uh, change over time. And uh, another challenge uh, related to tax expenditure um, data is that there are still uh, differing views uh, on whether certain tax provisions constitutes a tax incentive or uh, from part of a standard tax treatment. 
So uh, to overcome uh, comparability and interpretation issues, uh, the guidance notes uh, recommend to collect information on national tax rates, including uh, baselines. So this is not uh, this is done in the ADG reporting, for example. Uh, the note also recommend uh, to develop standardized approaches for measuring specific type uh, of tax expenditure. Uh, for example, the use of, use of harmonized uh, international benchmark or regional ones, uh, such as a single reference price on carbon emissions, uh, could help communicate uh, and interpret the data. Um, so, using benchmark, um, uh, so standardizing rates. Uh, such as is done in the effective carbon rates approach, um, so which standardized rates approach across fuels, by right, energy content, carbon content, etc. Uh, it helps normalize differences in gross values uh, and provide a more than based uh, for comparison. And um, so the OECD has done some work recently uh, in this area. Uh, so, as many of you uh, may be aware, uh, so the, uh, it has been calculating the effective tax rates for some time now. Um, and we have gone one step further. So, uh, we have um, now uh, built the, what we call the net effective carbon rates, uh, which measures the price on carbon emissions. So, arising from effective carbon rates, which include uh, fuel excise and carbon taxes and tradable permits. And uh, we have uh, deducted using uh, the OECD inventory data also um, direct transfers uh, to fossil fuel suppliers and end users uh, that can be assumed to decrease the pre tax uh, prices of fossil fuels. Um, so, a typical example uh, are budgetary transfers that compensate fuel suppliers for providing um, fossil fuels at prices that are regulated uh, below market levels. Um, oops, sorry. And so this approach um, used the benchmark, the same benchmark as used in the effective carbon rates. So 30 euros, 60 euro, and 120 euro per ton of CO2. And we have also calculated the revenue foregone uh, by not pricing emissions uh, to at least uh, one of these external benchmark. Um, so kind of a, another estimate of tax expenditures. Um, Um, so, the main advantages of this uh, approach is their ease of interpretation, uh, they are less subject to judgment um, and local conditions, and there are low comparisons between taxes paid by different sectors. There are also limitations, such as the fact that they disregard uh, behavioral responses and uh, do not include uh, transfer of risk or uh, reductions to VAT uh, and support to producers. So this is the result of uh, the net effective uh, carbon you rate. Have two and a half minutes left. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go quickly. So um, I'm gonna skip that slide and uh, talk uh, about uh, the benefits of uh, integrated, uh, integrating uh, FFS inventory data with uh, official statistics and uh, CA accounts. Um, so, this would require institutional cooperation between uh, ministries of finance, tax agencies, and statistical offici of, uh, offices. There would be many value added. Uh, it would open the data to a wi wide array of uh, additional uses and analysis. It would help ensure um, consistency uh, um, of the data uh, compiled across countries and enable uh, linkages with. Um, current international work, such as, uh, again, um, environmental subsidies and similar transfer, environmental tax revenue, and potentially environmental damaging subsidies. Um, there are current limitations, uh, for example, the fact that um, for the time being, mainly um, direct transfer are, um, are able to be integrated into the statistics. So, um, works remain for other areas, um, just to show, for example, the difference, uh, differences in scope uh, of uh, the OEC inventory, the uh, Eurostat environmental transfers, uh, subsidies, sorry, and similar transfers uh, work in the CS central framework. So uh, there are some overlaps, but not everything. Um, and to finish with, um, so I'll skip that slide as well. 
the guidance note also uh, identify uh, outstanding issues and areas for uh, further progress. Um, so there is a need to further harmonize uh, methods, develop common uh, measurement approaches uh, for a specific type of tax expenditure, um, develop additional guidance uh, to facilitate integration with the CIA and other work. Um, also guidance on the measurement of transfer of risk uh, and maybe further use of international uh, data. Uh, and this in this area, uh, international international fora uh, such as this one are uh, actually uh, very uh, useful. Thank you for your attention, and uh, happy to take uh, any question. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for this practical um, overview and also showing us how. You it is possible to report on fossil fuel subsidies. So now we have a few minutes for questions for all, uh, addressing all three presentations we saw. So is there anything in the floor or online? So if there's nothing, okay, yeah. So Georgia, please. And then Azerbaijan, but we can go one by one. Okay, uh, thank you all presenters uh, for the useful information and the presentations. Mm, so my question relates to um, uh, environmental, environmental taxes. Uh, so what do you think that uh, mining activity or fossil fuel subsidies on any activity related to environment and uh, its possibly change? Um, so um, the activity and its license uh, can be con considered as environmental taxes. So if yes, should we consider uh, the whole uh, environmental, so whole um, license fee um, uh, as the uh, environmental taxes or some percent of this uh, part? So thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Unfortunately, I think I have to check a little bit more exactly the guidance to, to answer you. So maybe I will do it later. Bye, Okay. Uh, for example, in my country, there are specific uh, environmental taxes. So we have uh, license, license of uh, mining, of fuel fire, and or any activities to relate to uh, environment. So how can we uh, how, how can we consider this uh, license tax? So can we consider as whole this license fee is environmental tax or a part of this license is um, belongs to environmental tax? So it's uh, very challenging. Uh, so uh, some um, intricate uh, activity, intricate um, topic for us. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I think I'm... Isabel, we'll check that and come back to you with this specific answer, since it's also quite a specific question. So then to Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And my question is also uh, to Miss Isabella. Uh, my question is also to Miss Isabella. And I wonder uh, if uh, energy taxes is applied to population or energy companies or fuel stations in practice uh, i don't i want to know about this thank you yes you, so you will have some energy taxes that that is the, that would be for corporation and some others for households so i think it, you have to go a little deeper to analyze which one goes to which institutional sector somehow. So maybe as well, if you have some specific, let's say, uh, taxes that are identified, uh, please just come back to us uh, by email bilaterally and then we can answer in more detail. Thank you. Okay, then um, Ireland. It's a general question, but maybe more for Sarah. Um, 
environmental NGOs are very interested in fossil fuel subsidies and they would like to see something being done about them. So the, I'm wondering, you still have the airline situation where they're not paying taxes on the fuel. And I'm wondering, do OECD or UN or Eurostat, are they seeing more engagement from statistical offices? What kind of progress and speed are we moving at towards measuring this? Thank you. Yes, yeah, Sarah, could you answer? Well, if I should go first, maybe yeah, Claire will, might want to compliment. Um, I should say that um, the SDG reporting has uh, given some momentum uh, in this area among statistical offices. As I said, in the OEC inventory, we were more in touch with ministries of finance. Um, we think it's a promising area because um, more and more countries are uh, including uh, the measurement of fossil fuel subsidies or the building of an inventory in their national climate and energy plans, are uh, mandating the nation national statistical offices to be involved in this area. Um, progress uh, is still uh, slow, but um, yeah, I think we have seen some um, some progress. Uh, of course, uh, it's still on basic data. And um, what I didn't say in the presentation is that regarding the building of, a, of an inventory and um, and improving the quality of data, actually countries uh, and national statistical office, offices have a big role to play uh, in this co consistency and harmonization across different uh, products and statistical products around this data. Okay, thank you. So now we have two more questions, one by IMF and one by Estonia. So perhaps you can ask them both and then they can be answered in, in comments. So IMF perhaps might start. Um, thank you for all the presentations. It's very informative and uh, useful. So um, as my colleagues mentioned in uh, uh, day one's presentation that uh, IMF and uh, many other um, international organizations now is leading this uh, new G20 data gap initiative. Um, on this initiative, uh, Recommendation 6 deals specifically on the environment um, impact and subsidies. I think um, right now, I think the first difficulty of this um, recommendation is how to define subsidy, as many uh, speakers already mentioned. So there are different views. Um, on the one extreme is to start with the statistical definition of subsidy and then to identify under those um, subsidies which are environmental um, impacting. On the other extreme, um, some uh, speakers also mentioned that um, there is a broader definition. It's any support uh, government provide to the economy that could impact environment. So I would like to hear the uh, view from three speakers in terms of um, any suggestion, guidance into uh, where to draw the line and to strike the right balance in a sense that um, there's a feasibility to compile this data within the uh, next three, five years, but also um, there is comparability across country, um, also um, to cover the, um, this uh, subsidy as comprehensive as possible. So this is one general question uh, for all three speakers. So my second question is more specifically about the estimation of tax subsidy. Um, I would like to hear the experience from um, the colleagues from um, UNEP and uh, um, OECD. Because we know when we talk about the tax subsidy, so it's estimation, so it's need to assumption to about the, um, how to say, consumer behaviors. So this behavior is endogenous and also change over time. So does that mean that you have to basically estimate this um, on a very high frequency? And also, um, sometimes estimate that will vary across years, very, um, uh, very frequently and very uh, significantly. So, how do you deal with this um, this time inconsistency over time? And also, what's your experience from your um, um, data compilation from countries at this point for the tax subsidy? Thank you. 
you can take it directly since this was uh, quite broad and then we'll do Estonia. So perhaps we start with Sarah since she's already on the screen and then to Claire and then to Isabel. Yes, to, so for, for the scope of reporting, um, I think uh, it's important and I forgot to mention, said, mention that in my previous re response that um, the, the data collected and gathered at national level uh, depends on both um, the ambition of the country, its resource uh, uh, in terms of human resources, but also uh, on whether budgetary documents do report some types of uh, subsidies. And therefore, um, countries develop uh, national data and fossil subsidy inventories based on the, both on their capacity and ambitions. More countries, are, uh, some countries are much, much more advanced than others. And uh, depending also on the purpose of the use of this inventory at national level, the country may want to, for example, have a broader scope of measure covered. For example, in Belgium, national fossil fuel subsidy inventory, um, there are some measures that are covered um, benefit, benefits to, um, to private companies uh, for, for the use of uh, cars from uh, private companies and things like that, that are not included in the OECD inventory because the OECD and international definitions tries to be um, as harmonized as possible across countries and takes into account the availability of data. Uh, and therefore there is a trade-off but uh, to, to, to be made uh, between the measures to be included and where. Uh, but obviously uh, the broader the scope at national level, the more easy it is to adapt for international purposes. Um, and regarding the uh, tax expenditure um, calculation methods, so currently uh, data uh, do not account for behavioral uh, responses uh, and changes uh, due, due to prices. Uh, it's a simple estimate of the revenue foregone uh, by not uh, collecting uh, some taxes, uh, in a sense. Uh, these indicators at an aggregated level gives a, a broad overview of trends. And as I was mentioning in my presentation, um, tax expenditure data are difficult to interpret, uh, and in particular, uh, variations uh, in trends and across countries are difficult to interpret because uh, they rely uh, on the benchmark sets by countries which are not harmonized currently. Um, so I'll stop here and I, because we could elaborate for hours uh, on these issues. Maybe, yeah, just to complement a little bit, although I think Sarah covered it, uh, uh, for most of it, um, on, the, on the scope of the definition. Yeah, of course they are, Choices that, that that have to be made, and like Sarah said, the the both the capacity and and the political willingness uh, play a big role. Um, but if I yeah, if I go back to the SDG methodology that was that was developed for this indicator, um, the the scope and choices that were made were both based on. Uh, the existing methodologies and the existing data sets that were in place and were also based on case studies uh, produced by countries to sort of make sure that, um, and again, this is a methodology that might be, that could be and probably will be revised in the future, but it was also developed on the base of what is the data currently existing and what is realistically achievable. Uh, in terms of, in terms of reporting um, and yeah, it's, for example, for that reason that tax expenditure data uh, was considered optional um, because yeah, it is, it does come with methodological difficulties um, and there needs to be more, um, uh, yeah, more work for to, to ensure comparability between countries. Um, so yeah, um, I, I guess uh, it, we, 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 it's not yet perfect and, and will require additional methodological work for sure. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you for the question from the IMF colleagues and the answer from the other colleagues. I think I, I can just subscribe as well, you know, somehow to this trade of between things that you can observe quite with the data. So definitely there was one slide, you know, from the colleagues where you, you see you have always this kind of uh, some transfers or taxes that are uh, observed everywhere and then of course it then all this let's say more tax abatement tax relief that is more 
kind of problematic because you have to define as well or uh, for other data you have to define this benchmark and then this comparability issue is quite uh, it's a difficult situation at least uh, in EU they say we need to 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 have comparison you know between different countries so yeah here it's I think we can start definitely with something that are uh, definitely include it and everyone agree with it, with that and then see how to develop let's say further methodology or to agree on some methodology but this kind of benchmark or implicit carbon prices uh, it, it gives so much volatility into your results data results that maybe yeah, this is something that say it's a trade-off so where do you go uh, in between thank you Thank you. So, Miriam, just briefly, and then the question by Estonia directly afterwards. Thank you very much. Just to, to, com to complement what Sarah said concerning the uh, Data Gaps Initiative, the recommendation six, on whether we should adopt a broader definition of subsidies or, or a more narrow uh, statistical definition, uh, that question is still open, but we recommend uh, from the OECD side to prioritize direct budgetary transfers, tax expenditure, and induced transfers. Uh, we could very well get started with direct budgetary transfers, which is more easy to obtain, but the objective should be uh, ultimately to cover the three and then progressively to move uh, to other types of uh, support measures. Thank you. So, Estonia, and to whom as well you might ask the question, please specify. Okay, thank you. Uh, Indeed, yes. My, my question actually was in the same direction related, um, and it was related to SDG uh, indicates and fossil fuel subsidies, uh, 12C1, uh, and it's one to UNEP, yeah, uh, to clear. And um, I, I think, and I, I know that, um, uh, you know, the SDG indicators are important, and this is one of the indicators where statistical system and uh, CIA could provide input uh, Yes, and I know you do ask, uh, ask about uh, us this indicator and the country, uh, statistical offices and want to report. But in our stats office, it, uh, how to say, it is, a, it is a problem to, like, discuss now uh, uh, what, to, uh, what, to, uh, what to consider on the, uh, this indicator. And um, so... You list in your, uh, uh, in your presentation also with one, two, three, four, and say that uh, direct transfers, induced transfers, important, uh, and tax expenditures and transfer risk to, uh, uh, to government, so not that important. So in that sense, uh, uh, we are a bit confused in Stats Office. I'm not personally responsible for this, in, this indicator, uh, uh, compilation of a da uh, a data, but um, uh, well, uh, in order to kind of to get started, I would I'm, I'm really thinking what could could be done as this is something that needs budgetary analysis in one hand, and there is kind of a new kind of a clear rules to uh, to produce uh, produce this figure. But when I was wondering whether you in UNEP uh, could couldn't actually start to estimating these uh, fossil subsidies for the countries applying already. For example, I know that the OECD has made a for countries and also about Estonia, the, the, the estimation of fossil fuel subsidies, why not already start fusing the data which is already available in other international organizations and ask countries like us in Estonia maybe just to revise from our side these figures and come up with this coverage information so it won't be empty. Currently, just, you know, it's empty for us in, in your database. So I'm just thinking how to we could we get started to get it get it done to get it uh, in some ways running thank you yeah thank you uh, and uh, uh, I'll try to clarify as much as I can uh, in this uh, in this short term um, on the the different types of subsidies um, I sorry I didn't mean to say that some were more important than than others but maybe uh, building an on what was said by the, the, the OECD colleague just now. Um, the, the reason why direct transfers and, and GIS transfers were uh, uh, put forward is, also, is start, start with the fact that um, uh, 
it's it's based more on a, of an e, on an ease and availability of data. Um, so not to say that tax expenditure are not important. They are extremely important, and actually in the OECD countries they represent the majority of of uh, of subsidies. Um, is it again? It has more to do with the uh, the availability of data and the technic technicity of uh, of reporting on this. Um, so the reason why we are encouraged. Uh, to start with direct transfers and induced transfers is because, yeah, if you start from scratch, um, it the data is just um, easier to to compile and collect. Um, now, on the the fact that at uh, at this current stage, um, you start with a with an empty database. So the 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 reason we um, ultimately this this as the indicator and the reporting from countries is meant. For countries to develop their an internal database, um, it's not only for us to. When it comes to tracking um, uh, fossil fuel subsidies at global, regional, or national level, like I mentioned, there are quite a few uh, availability uh, databases available, uh, starting with the OECD inventory or the AES on consumer subsidies, and. <clears throat> The the fact is that we could go and we could go and um, and handpick the data from there, um, but the 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 objective is also to to develop country ownership on this data. Um, so of course uh, we're happy to work with countries and other partners to um, to to work on putting together databases uh, on on this indicator, and that's something that we've done with the OECD in a few countries. Uh, some countries. Um, have decided to report on this on this on this SDG indicator through the OECD, and that's something that is um, is actually um, 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 a, a, an excellent idea and 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 definitely encouraging our side. Um, the we we just want to make sure that um, if there is if there is country input if there is data input on our side, um, it will be validated in a way that is. That builds country ownership on this data. Um, so yeah, happy to discuss it. Uh, to discuss this a bit more in depth after. Um, but um, yeah, that's the that's the rationale behind it. Behind us not filling up the okay. data. Okay. Thank you, Claire. You, Sorry. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to. Time is running, and um, I think we have to stop there. So we have, um, yeah, we have to move on to the next presentation. We have one general question in the chat. We'll address later on in the panel discussion. So now uh, we have one country presentation before the coffee break, and it's also online. It's from Paola Ansieta from Statistics Canada. Are you with us? So um, I can already. Morning. Yes. Uh, great yes. that you're can you there. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Um, you can start your presentation, perhaps, and I'll just introduce you. Yeah. So um, Paola will talk on environmental tax account in Canada. Um, she's an economist working on the environmental account and statistics, st statistics division of Statistics Canada. Her work involves the development and the implementation of the activity accounts in the program. Her most recent area of focus has been Canada's first environmental tax account. So I think, yeah, if you could start your presentation, and we cannot see the video either. And again, you have 50 minutes, and I'll tell you three minutes before the end. Yes, good morning. I'm just having some uh, monitor issues. Uh, just, just one, one moment. moment. Uh, the sound is a bit echoing, so I might change something. Yes. yes. So, so my, my video, video is not working. Yeah. I... No, we... Can, Can you, you see, see my, my screen? screen? Yes, but your your sound is really echoing. I don't know if you have a, a headset would be nice or something because it's... Um... Yes. yes. One... Yeah, or turn off your own um, uh, your own sound. Of the the micro the microphone of your computer, that would, yeah, <laughs> not the not the not the microphone the sound yeah sorry. The speaker. Yes. So now we see the presentation and you could start. Can you hear me there? 
Now it's good, loud and clear. Perfect. And you can see my screen, so I can't not see you. You can see my screen? Yes, yes. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you all today. We're very pleased to introduce Statistics Canada's new upcoming release of the Environmental Tax Account. The estimates, the estimated release date is currently set for April 23. Today, we want to give you a brief overview of this account, including which estimates you can expect to see, discuss data sources and methodology, and explain what future research holds in store amongst other points. So what exactly does Statistics Canada's ETA measure? The ETA seeks to quantify the revenues collected by government for products that have a negative environmental impact on the Canadian economy. It is concerned with estimating the amount of environmental taxes paid annually by industries and households amongst other economic sectors. The main environment tax statistics reported relate to the annual total taxes levied by government on various commodities in specific categories as stipulated by the OECD system of environmental and economic accounting central framework 2012. This account captures total environmental taxes composed of total energy taxes, which in turn are composed of energy and fuel for transport taxes, carbon taxes, emission trading permits, as well as transportation taxes, pollution taxes, and natural resource taxes. Energy taxes include taxes on energy products used for both transport and stationary purposes. The most important energy products for transport purposes are fuel and diesel fuel. <clears throat> energy products for stationary use include fuel oils, natural gas, coal, and electricity. The ETA also reports carbon tax, which is a tax charge placed on greenhouse gas emissions, released mainly from burning fossil fuels. Other taxes on greenhouse gas emissions, other than CO2, are also included. Also in scope are the emission trading permits, which record government revenue from the auctioning of emission permits, also known as the cap and trade system, which are treated as taxes on production in the national accounts. Transportation taxes include taxes related to personal and commercial motor vehicle permits, taxes on commercial transport equipment, such as buses or trucks, related transport services, such as duties on charter or scheduled flights are also included here, as they conform to the general definition of environmentally related taxes. For pollution taxes, recycling fees on products, such as computer parts or paint products are placed in this category. Non-energy related CO2 taxes are also included, such as levies on tires and plastic waste. Natural resource taxes include taxes linked to the extraction and use of natural resources, such as water, forest, wild flora, and fauna, as these activities deplete natural resources. These taxes do not include those designed to capture the resource rent or royalties from the extraction of natural resources on taxes on land. These estimates will be available at the Canada, provincial, and territorial levels for reference years 2010 to 2018. ETA estimates will also be disseminated by economic sector composed of total industry, households, government, and nonprofit institutions, and by gross fixed capital formation. The initial publication will not have the suggested industry breakdown, although this is planned for the next release which will be the time series 2010 to 2019, planned for late November 2023. Environmental tax shares in the ETA are calculated for taxes on products and taxes on production only. So income tax, uh, capital taxes, et cetera, are not in scope at this time, though this is earmarked for future development. Taxes on products are taxes payable per unit of some good or service, and taxes on production are taxes payable less subsidies receivable on goods or services produced as outputs on other taxes, such as those payable on the labor, machinery, 
buildings or other assets used in production. I stress again that Canada's ETA, the guidelines followed, that for Canada's uh, ETA, the guidelines followed are those rooted, <clears throat> excuse me, in the OECD definition of taxes, which is in line with the SIA uh, economic accounting, whereby taxes are compulsory unrequited payments in cash or kind made by institutional units to government units. Throughout the development of this account, a methodical and clear structure fixed with an internationally agreed definitions, standards, and accounting principles was always of primary importance in order to facilitate international comparisons. With regards to the data sources, the structure, framework, concepts, and methods used in the development of the ETA are based on the Canadian National, Provincial, and Territorial Supply and Use Tables, or SUTs, published by Statistics Canada, and to some extent, the Canadian Financial Government Statistics Tables. Both are robust data sources, which afford the possibility to present disaggregated data by economic sector and are amenable to industry-level analysis. As per the OECD methodological guidelines in line with the SIA for environmentally related tax revenue accounts, a crucial step is to separate environmentally related taxes from other taxes and derive ETA data. The supply use tables focus on measuring the productive activity and structure of the Canadian economy with over 490 commodities and over 270 economic sectors, in addition to breakdowns by margins and tax types. The supply use tables with their detailed geographical industry level and commodity level breakdown allow for a precise review of in-scope commodities to be identified as tax bases. Since the Canadian supply use tables account for all products supplied and used in the Canadian economy, all environmental tax revenue in Canada is accounted for in these tables. The construction of the ETA, therefore, involves developing sources and methods that decouple environmental tax revenue activity from total economic activity. It is important to note that the supply use tables are released with a three-year lag. Therefore, the release of the most recent reference year of the ETA would be comprised of projections moving forward. As per the SNA, an environmental tax is a tax whose tax base is a physical unit of something that has a proven specific negative impact on the environment. Using the supply use tables affords a robust data source for identifying environmentally related tax bases. The main source for the environment tax data are the margins and tax tables, a submatrix of the supply use tables. For extraction of other taxes, such as taxes on products and taxes on production, the taxes on products and the use purpose or tables respectively, both also from the supply use table are used. Some tax bases included in the ETA are embedded in aggregate taxes on products or taxes on production lines, and therefore difficult to tease out. For these tax bases, the ETA extracts estimates from the Canadian Government Finance Statistics or the CGFS tables. An example is the emission trading permits. The CGFS estimates produced by the Public Sector Statistics Division at Statistics Canada are available by region and by NAICS. Other estimates extracted from the CGFS are personal motor vehicle registrations, commercial motor vehicle registrations, and hunting and fishing licenses. However, because the ETA uses a slightly different industry classification system, the IOIC, estimates cannot be disaggregated at the industry level. As mentioned previously, the supply use tables provide the same table structure by tax types. This extra layer of available information is vital to the production of the ETA estimates. Essentially, each tax type is a sub matrices of the whole supply use table framework containing only a specific tax. For the ETA, the in-scope tax is identified for the federal air transportation tax, federal custom import duties, federal excise tax, federal gas tax, provincial environmental tax, the provincial gas tax, and for uh, reference year 2019 moving forward, the federal environment tax. Referring again to the guidelines, 
they provide a list of tax bases that identify environmentally related taxes, most notably energy products, transport, for stationary purposes, carbon taxes, and emission trading schemes. For this process, we can truly appreciate the robust detail available and the commodity breakdown provided by the supply use tables. With regards to our methods, here's a very broad schematic that shows how the ETA estimates are produced. The first step involves compilation of taxes and identifying in scope commodities. From these full tax lists of commodities, only the in scope tax type revenues are extracted by year and by region, thus providing a, co a commodity tax revenue total. Step two involves assigning this total to the proper tax base or account line. For this, we rely on the expertise of our Statistics Canada colleagues who are the custodians of this tax data for the guidance on the environmental link between each tax type and commodity, as well as the OECD guidelines, which provide a good description of what is included in each tax base category. In this example, our supply use table colleagues inform that the environmental component of taxes on tires relates to the waste aspect as a source of pollution when cross-checking this with the OECD guidelines, one can see that the pollution category includes waste management for products like tires. As a result, this fictional amount of $3 million will be accounted for under the pollution line in the account. Allocating environment taxes by economic sector, industry groups, households, nonprofit institutions, governments, and gross fixed capital formation is the last step. The allocation to industries and households is based on the taxpayer principle, that is, the final user of the tax base. Here, we'd like to show how the account will be presented for the full time series. For all tax lines, the total taxes on products and production universe, finally, the share of total environmental taxes of this universe. These estimates will be available at the Canada level by province and by territory. In addition, they will be disaggregated as mentioned previously by total industry, households, government, nonprofit institutions, and gross fixed capital formation. Due to some conceptual issues, this future release will be more limited than originally intended. Specifically, the time series will reach until 2018 inclusive and the possibility to disseminate by a full industry classification breakdown will not be possible. Point one, for this industry breakdown, the ETA would apply the supply use tape expenditure patterns. We will work with external stakeholders to ensure the most sound methodology is being used, which captures important issues, such as industry exemptions, especially for carbon taxes. Point two, in addition, Treatment of the fairly recent Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act is still being reviewed internally with regards to the supply use tables. This will affect reference years 2019 moving forward. Point three, as we know, carbon taxes garner much attention. With regards to carbon tax, disaggregation at the industry level, the ETA would de derive these taxes through specific ratios within the supply use table framework. We will work with external stakeholders to ensure the most sound methodology is being used for disaggregation of this tax type. It is important to note that, of course, the soon to be disseminated total industry level estimates for carbon tax are indeed reviewed and sent. Point four, as mentioned, we will work with stakeholders on how to best represent tax exempt industries within the industry level breakdown. And moving forward, after the expected release next month, we anticipate annual releases after the supply use table release. We would like to expand the account to include other taxes and provide a detailed industry level disaggregation. As mentioned, we will form working groups with other related Government of Canada departments to incorporate estimates under the new GGPPA. Also, as mentioned, currently, the ETA is developed within the scope of taxes on products and production. For a full expression of the account, as per the CIA central framework, the account could include income taxes on corporations and households, capital taxes, and other current taxes. This would be especially useful as income taxes can form a large portion 
of all government revenue collected in Canada. And finally, here's a country comparison taking into account energy taxes only as a percentage of GDP. The Canada estimates are extracted from those reported to the OECD. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. I think this um, yeah, was really interesting to see the, the practical approach and also the details, which for practitioners are really important to see how other countries do that and also puts the parenthesis on this part of the, um, the first part of the session. So I think we have time for one or max two short questions, if there are any on the floor or in the chat. So yeah, I just want to check if there are others, but then yeah, we have a question from Estonia. Please be brief. No, no, go ahead. Someone else has, wants to ask it go for, uh, first. I, just regarding the conceptual, thank you, Paula, uh, and hi. Uh, regarding the conceptual uh, 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 issues that um, uh, and the industry level breakdown and the issues relate, uh, related to that one, I would say that we, uh, so, uh, I would suggest that you, if you compile this data for the national accounts yourself uh, with environment, you know, this uh, environmental taxes part, you could avoid this situation. So this is what we do in our case, also national accounts, we do not need that detail in, uh, for regarding the taxes. We are not interested in, uh, so we don't need it. So we compile it. So we deliver it to national accounts. We do all the details. Uh, and the fuels and the details of the taxes, we deliver it to national accounts, they uh, work on it, we give it to back when we argue, and then it, it's in integrated and it's uh, uh, harmonized from uh, both sides. So this is what we do. Otherwise, we would have been uh, at, at the same situation what you, uh, what you have. So we suggest that you just compile it yourself, harmonize it, agree with national accounts, and then you have had it well done on industry level. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Well noted. Thank you. Okay, then Isabel has a question. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Paula. I have a question regarding this uh, preliminary uh, years that you will have. You said you have 19 and then you will have 20, 21 as preliminary data. Uh, why is it preliminary? Is it because your supply and use will be preliminary or uh, are you somehow, I don't know, having some estimation on the taxes itself in Project uh, 2021? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, so as, as mentioned, we do uh, base our estimates on the supply use table release. The supply use table re uh, do release with a three-year lag. So we would have to do a, a projected preliminary one, prelim projected preliminary two years, if we wanted to uh, project the most recent um, estimates for this account. We would have to project, yes. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So I think, yeah, we are, we are um, done from this part and I head over to Michael to decide on how long we have for coffee. Yeah, it's a hard decision because it takes away time from, from later on, but I think we should do the 15 minutes, otherwise it's not realistic to grab a coffee, right? But again, please try to be back really after 15 minutes. This is, what, 20 past. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't know how to stop this. Am I still on? Nope. Oh, goodness. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, que no se dijo eso.
mucha experiencia antes. Okay, let's take you our seats. We can start. So let us continue. Please um, take your seats. <laughs> yes. 
Thank you, Johanna. So um, we have two more country presentations, and then there's time for questions. We'll take them together. And then there's time for panel discussion also, where we'd like to involve the, um, the, yeah, the audience. So our first country presentation is on fossil fuel subsidies and ECR calculations in Sweden by Susanna Roth. Susanna is the coordinator of environmental accounts at Statistics Sweden. She is an economist and has worked with environmental accounts since 2016, for example, on air emission accounts, environmental taxes, and projects for developing statistics on PETs. Before joining Statistics Sweden, she worked at EBL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, with environmental and climate policy analysis. So please, Susanna. Thank you. Um, very happy to be here today and present our pilot on fossil fuel subsidies and ECR calculations. Uh, so first of all, thanks to all the team members uh, uh, that worked at the project at Statistics Sweden and also thanks to Eurostat, of course, for financing this grant project. So first, some background. Uh, so Statistics Sweden did a first pilot on monitoring greenhouse gas emissions and that was done in 2019. Uh, the fo study focused on finding a, term a useful terminology for measuring PEDs and fossil fuel subsidies, and some data collection was tested. However, the results were not fully in line with CEA. It could, for example, not be broken down by NACE or by fuel. So we wanted to investigate if we could produce these statistics regularly, and therefore we applied for this Eurostat grant project, which we have just finalized. And sort of one of the uh, things that made it possible to do some of the calculations was new methodology improvement in industry allocation of environmental taxes. And I will come back to that later. Uh, so throughout this project, there's been a lot of development in the international statistical community, as we heard earlier today. And also several countries have produced statistics or pilots on this, and we are very thankful for all the help and inspiration we have received throughout this project. So uh, during this project, we have uh, tested several data sources and recalculated the time series many, many times. Uh, I've listed some of the sort of issues that we struggled a bit with uh, throughout this project. And first of all, uh, PEDS, it's a quite broad uh, uh, terminology, so potentially environmentally damaging subsidies. Uh, it could be anything damaging uh, to the environment, but we have just looked at fossil fuel subsidies. And then uh, for the next bullet's point on explicit transfers and implicit transfers, so direct transfers and tax abatement, uh, we have also thought a lot about on which one and in relation to what, how to measure it. Uh, so those are also the two that would be needed for the SDG reporting on SDG target 12C1. Uh, and moreover, uh, one objective with this project was also to do ECR calculation by fuel and industry, and I will give some example of these results later. So starting off with explicit transfers, and I won't be long on that topic. Uh, basically, what we have used uh, as methodology is the same methodology as for environmental subsidies. So direct transfers that can be found in central government budgets. And the starting point for this was a mapping down by the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, but actually we found really no direct links to fossil fuel production or consumption uh, when we went through the budget lines, at least not yet. Uh, we did find several explicit transfers linked to transport, so, such as support to airport or the shipping industry or transport in rural parts of Sweden. And also outside the scope of fossil fuels, we found support to fishing industry, agriculture, regional investment support that might be sort of broader than fossil fuel subsidies. But it's also important to note that the exact effect of a subsidy scheme uh, is very difficult to assess. It's just not possible uh, there, but maybe not very difficult is a better word. Uh, there are very few ex post or ex ante studies of different subsidy schemes and also some sort of uh, guidance or harmonization across module would be needed here. And it was also mentioned in the presentation earlier today, like where to draw the line on what to include and not. 
Uh, so moving on to implicit transfers, I'd like to start with a snapshot of environmental taxes in Sweden. Uh, so you see here tax revenues, environmental tax revenues in 2020, and you see four blocks of taxes. In the bottom you have everything not related to carbon pricing, so mainly transport taxes. And then we have the gray area, and that's the carbon dioxide tax, and it was introduced in 1991 in Sweden. And then in orange, we have the energy tax. Uh, so all fuel consumption or fossil fuel consumption in Sweden, they are both subject to the carbon tax and to the energy tax. And then on top, we have the electricity tax. Uh, so this project focused on tax abatement on fossil fuel taxes. Uh, so the three taxes uh, in the top of this uh, diagram. And they were calculated with the revenue foreground method and we used the uh, tax accounts as the basis. And then we mapped out all the tax exemptions by industry and by fuel. And this was the methodology improvement that I mentioned earlier. So at first we thought that this exercise would only be uh, help, helpful for improving the allocation of energy related environmental taxes. Uh, but we also uh, sort of discovered that we could also use this information for calculating implicit transfers. So looking at the energy tax, the carbon tax and the electricity tax, and I should probably also say that the electricity tax uh, contributes very little to these implicit transfers because uh, the electricity mix uh, in uh, Sweden, uh, it only contains, contains about 2% fossil fuels. Uh, but then, as I said, the tax abatement, they vary for different industries and between years. And we also included this diesel versus petrol discount. So coming from that diesel historically has had a lower tax rate compared to petrol and still, and still has. So how big are these subsidies in monetary values? Well, it depends on what you uh, compare against. And you see here three different results with three different benchmarks. Uh, so for implicit transfer in general, the higher tax rate, the higher subsidies if industries are not paying the full price. Uh, so the top line here is our sort of main assumption and we call it with and without exemption. So that is comparing the actual tax rate from the tax authority with the price that the industries are paying. And then in the middle, we have uh, a price of 1,190 Swedish crowns, which is approximately 120 euro. And the reason for choosing uh, this uh, is because the Ministry of Finance in Sweden, they use this as the sort of normative tax rate when they calculate revenue foregone uh, for uh, their budget. Uh, so, and the, lo the lowest one is a price of 60 euro per ton. Uh, so the take-home message here is, uh, yeah, obviously that the results uh, vary uh, depending on the benchmarks uh, that you use, but also that we see a decreasing trend in these indirect uh, transfers. Uh, we can also break this down by industry, and here is a result on uh, this based on the assumption with and without exemptions, uh, but I think I'll skip that slide and move on to the ECR calculations instead. Uh, so we have calculated also these average uh, effective carbon rate, um, so euro per ton for combustion rate re related emissions. And again, how is carbon priced? Uh, we have the energy tax, we have the carbon dioxide tax, and we have the electricity tax, but the electricity tax, will, we know it contributes very little. And then we have the trading scheme from the, in, in the U EU. And what we want to do is that we want to adjust for only um, including the combustion of fossil fuels, uh, because the, both these taxes, the energy tax and the carbon dioxide tax, uh, they are only taxed on fuel consumption. However, in the ETS system, uh, the, the, the ETS system does not split between process-related emissions and uh, combustion of fuels. Uh, and therefore, we haven't really figured out how to do that yet, so therefore in the examples I'm going to show you now, the ETS price is uh, not included, so please have that in mind. So looking at some results, and here is uh, average ECR by industry in 2020. So it's the different uh, NACE industries in the bottom. Uh, the bars, uh, they represent the price paid, so euro per ton. 
Uh, but we also wanted to combine this with information on how sort of important they are for total emissions. Um, so the second scale to the right is uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, and the small dots in the graph illustrate this. Uh, so, for example, if you look at NACE C, so the manufacturing industry, uh, we see that the average price is around 50 euro per ton, uh, but they also have a high impact on total emissions, uh, so around 7,000 kilotons of carbon dioxide. And we can take households uh, to the right end as another example. Uh, they contribute even more to total emissions, uh, around 8,000 uh, kilotons of carbon dioxide, uh, but they have a way higher uh, average ECR, uh, above 250 euro per ton. And also, again, please note that this does not include the ETS price. Uh, we have done some proxies uh, for, to, for how to adjust for this, and we think it will be around 5 euro extra per ton in 2020 for the trading industries. So, yeah. So for NAC, you can imagine it might be 55 instead of 51 or something like that. Uh, so this is the same sort of graph, but instead it's uh, by fuel, uh, and I don't won't go into details here either. Um, skip, keep moving on to the next slide. This is another way of illustrating uh, the average ECR. This is a time series uh, for the manufacturing industry. Uh, so we see here how the carbon tax and the energy tax uh, contribute uh, to, to the total ECR. Electricity tax is also included, but it's, uh, again, very small, so you can't really see it in the graph. Uh, so this can sort of be an interesting way of looking at how different policy shifts in uh, tax abatement or tax levels affect the ECR. Uh, so, for example, in 2011, uh, you see that the ECR increased with around 5 euro per ton in the manufacturing industry. And this was because a tax uh, discount for trading industry was changed from 100% to 70%. Uh, so we can actually follow those types of changes in direction in tax policies in these ECR calculations. Uh, and again, it will be interesting to also add the ETS uh, price on top of uh, this diagram. Uh, so so to, to sum up a bit, uh, one way also to illustrate this pricing mechanism is to look at it uh, in different price ranges. Uh, so we have different ECR bands here, starting at uh, zero euro per ton and then ending above 120 euro per ton. So the time series, uh, there's a time series to the left and the circle diagram for 2020 to the right. And what we see then for 2020 is that almost a third of all the CIA emission accounts emissions, uh, they don't have a price on carbon. So that's airlines and maritime transport mainly. And then we see that 57% uh, of the uh, emissions, uh, they have a price uh, that's higher than 120 euro per ton. And this can also sort of be an interesting way of comparison across countries and comparing different uh, price uh, mechanisms in different countries. So, uh, some conclusions and issues uh, to address further. Yeah, so first of all, as I said uh, many times now, we need to adjust for these ETS-related emissions. And also this importance is increasing. You see here to the right a graph on the ETS price, and yeah, there's been a rapidly increase in 2021 and 2022 in the ETS price. When I took out this uh, diagram a week ago or something, it was, I think it says 100 euro per ton, so that's... Uh, quite a lot compared to earlier years. And also, we also have a completely new energy price situation in Europe. And to the image to the right with the small house here, uh, it's in Swedish and it illustrates a new electricity support to all households that were paid just a couple of weeks ago. And the other uh, in, uh, text in Swedish here is uh, an announcement by the government on reduction in tax rates on petrol and fuels for heating production. Uh, so all this, uh, these sort of new subsidies, on the new, these new subsidy schemes needs to of course be taken into account when we produce new reference years. And also moving on, uh, we think that a reference price for implicit transfer is needed. Otherwise, understanding these PEDs or fossil fuel subsidies and comparison across countries can be very tricky. 
Uh, we sort of prefer, prefer this average ECR. Uh, it's more intuitive to compare across countries and also to follow the policy development. Uh, and we also welcome uh, continuous discussion about this topic uh, internationally. And then I should probably say something about what we plan to do next. As I said, we just finalized uh, this grant project in the end of February. And we have been in contact with our Ministry of Finance earlier in this project, and they are interested in the result, and we want to present this uh, to them. And then the plan is to publish something, at least on ECR, and we think that's going to be in June when we public publish our environmental taxes. So, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Susanna, on this. I think especially one of the last points you mentioned is really important, or puts a lot of work on most of us that since there have been um, energy subsidies introduced in the last year due to the um, skyrocketing energy prices at least in in Europe so um, yeah on a related issue we now have a presentation from Luxembourg are you with us yes great so um, we have Olivier, Olivier Tunus with us. Um, Olivier is the head of the satellite, satellite accounts unit at the National Statistical Institute of Luxembourg, where he is in charge, among others, to develop the integrated statistical system on energy and to produce the official energy efficiency and renewable indicators. He also oversees the production of the national list of environmental indicators, and since 2019, climate change related indicators for Luxembourg. He has a PhD in environmental science. So he'll talk on measuring Luxembourg's support for fossil fuels preliminary results. And again, you have 50 minutes and three minutes before I'll tell you. The floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, first, I want to apologize to not be with you in the room this, this year, but thanks to invite me uh, anywhere online uh, to, to present the result of the Luxembourg uh, exercise um, to measure fossil fuel uh, um, support. Um, certainly, I don't need to go very deep in, in this slide. Uh, we already see that there is a growing international demand for these statistics. We have a presentation from Claire uh, on the SDGs indicator. You also know that Eurostat has a task force working on, on this topic and there is a voluntary uh, data collection this year. And we also uh, have this exercise from OECD uh, to carry out an inventory of support measure for fossil fuels. And here I need to thank colleagues from OECD for their help in our uh, own national exercise to compile uh, fossil fuel subsidies. As you can see also, uh, I do not mention really a, a, a national demand. Uh, to be honest, there is not really a, a national request for this kind of statistics. Uh, I'm afraid that the focus of uh, decision maker is more uh, on the face out of the country from the use of the fossil fuels, like for example, to to not allow new installation of heating system based on oil or gas, or to plan the end of thermic engine for for vehicles. Nevertheless, we we decide to to go for this exercise and try a first calculation for for our country. Uh, so uh, the idea is to, was to make a, a list of all supporting measures and then try to quantify uh, each measure. This is the inventory approach presented by Claire and, and, and promoted by, by OCD, OECD. And you see here uh, the list of, uh, of uh, supports that we have. Uh, identify. Uh, from one side, we already discussed about explicit transfer, so uh, means direct transfer uh, from the government to some company. We don't have so much kind of, of transfer in, in, in Luxembourg. We only have 
we only find one one transfer for the new gas uh, infrastructure in uh, 2021. And uh, more interesting was uh, another type of transfer. This is implicit transfer in the category of rev revenue for GAN and mainly uh, lower excise and tax abatements. You probably know that it's important for Luxembourg because uh, our uh, excise and tax uh, for uh, fuel uh, are lower than uh, the foreigner country. So we have a lot of commuters and uh, uh, tourism co uh, coming in Luxembourg to buy uh, fuels and they give a lot of revenue to, to the public budget. And then it was interesting to, to go for this uh, uh, estimation uh, of fossil support. And the last type of support that we find is uh, the freely allocated allowance uh, because uh, Luxembourg of course participate to the ETS uh, system and as many other countries we allocate some, some, some free permits to some companies and then we can consider that this is a uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, support. Here the question is in which type of transfer, could probably implicit transfer, but uh, in which category, uh, it's not clear for us. Uh, we imagine that it will be more in revenue for GAN, but we learn that the experience from other country is to consider this as a direct transfer. So we still need to discuss an international level to be sure to have the same classification for, for this uh, revenue. Uh, one slide on the calculation methods uh, for direct transfer. Well, it's like for the Sweden experience, it's quite easy to obtain the, the statistic from the government budget. Uh, concerning the uh, lower excise and tax abatement, in fact, we uh, estimate uh, statistics based on energy uh, statistics and legal act, because of course the the excise is uh, a, a legal uh, information. Um, and then, what we need, in fact, for this estimation is to define the reference value and the definitions that we adopt for the Luxembourg exercise is that we use the highest value for the same energy product in, in, the, in the country. And then it's easy to calculate by uh, multiply the quantity sold by the difference between the highest value uh, and the apply value for, for the product. Concerning uh, the other uh, transfer, which is uh, freely allocated allowance. In fact, we obtain this information from, from CO2 permits account. I'm not sure that many countries have this kind of account, but this is the case for Luxembourg. Uh, but uh, in, in, in short, uh, what we do is that we, we define a reference price uh, and uh, for 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 um, for permits means uh, for uh, CO2 and we choose uh, the value from the European market uh, for, for ETS permits and then uh, we multiply th uh, simply the number of, of uh, free allocated uh, permits to the average uh, price. Um, there is also some borderline cases that I want to, to discuss with you. The first is where for carbon tax in Luxembourg, we implement that in 2021. Uh, now in 2023, this is uh, 30 euro per, per tons. Uh, but we also have in our law an exemption of this carbon tax for company who participate to the ETS market, because we don't want that this company pay uh, twice uh, the price of the, of the carbon. So in, in terms of definition, this is an exemption, but should we really 
uh, include them in this uh, calculation of the fossil fuel support, uh, it's, it's not clear. Another case is uh, the exemption of uh, excess for uh, kerosene on aviation. And here's the difficulty is that there is no reference value because uh, um, I don't know uh, really at international level, but I, I have the impression that there, there is this international agreement to not have excess on, on kerosene. Uh, so how to calculate, how to estimate uh, fossil fuel support in this case for this project? Uh, of course, we can do that for a carbon tax exemption because we don't have carbon tax for kerosene in Luxembourg, and we could estimate that uh, based on uh, the, the normal level uh, of carbon tax uh, in Luxembourg. So it will be interesting to have your view on, on, on this aspect later. Uh, I continue with the preliminary results uh, and you see here um, on this graph the, the disaggregation between the different type of transfer. You see that this is mainly uh, the lower axis uh, who produce uh, support for fossil fuels and after that come the free allocated allowance. And if you see this graph you have the impression that's okay uh, we support or Luxembourg support more and more uh, fossil fuels uh, and in fact it's not really uh, the case in fact here is just a price effect because as I mentioned you we use the, the price of ton CO2 on uh, EU market and you see on this second graph that this price increase year by year and then the increase of uh, the fossil fuels uh, support from Luxembourg is really related to the trend of the price on, on EU market and not to uh, an increase of the quantity or an increase of type of measure um, uh, done by, by, by Luxembourg. So this is something to think uh, when we try to analyze this kind of, of statistics at national level that it's sometimes just mathematical that we have an increase of the total amount. Um, and then I come to uh, the question of comparability between country and perhaps this could be a uh, a nice topic to discuss for for the, the for the panel uh, because yes it's nice to calculate this uh, value as, as this amount of, of support uh, at national level but uh, is it really helpful at international level this is a question uh, in the sense that is it really some value that we could compare from one country to another? Um, just for the reflection, concerning explicit transfer, di direct transfer from front, yes, certainly we could compare this uh, at international level. But if we look at uh, the freely allocated allowance, uh, the total amount is not directly comparable because it's related to the number of companies who participate to this, uh, to this ETS market. And for example, for Luxembourg, we have very few uh, ETS companies, so certainly it's not comparable to um, the big country like France or, or Germany. And concerning lower excise so, and... Three uh, minutes left, Olivier. Thank you. Uh, and tax ab abatement. If we use the method that we apply in Luxembourg, means that we use a national value as a reference to compare the, uh, uh, the difference of price on this measure. Uh, of course, we, we could not compare from one country to another uh, because this is dependent of the normal uh, normal value. 
What perhaps we could compare, it's not the total amount, but perhaps the, the size of the reduction between the normal uh, value and, and the apply value, the lower X size, for example. This is perhaps something that we need to, to test at international uh, level. And uh, last reflection also that uh, I want to share with you in, in conclusion of this presentation is um, also take care uh, how uh, it's, it's difficult to analyze this, this kind of statistics. And it's, it's come to the question from, from Jerry just before when we say that uh, uh, NGO want to see the r a reduction of this kind of fossil fuel supports. Uh, but in the case of Luxembourg, uh, a lower axis is uh, usually uh, for, for reducing the price on energy for household in the time that we want to have a more affordable uh, life for, for households, and then we apply lower excise. Uh, and view like this is, this kind of support is, is good for the country and then for households, is, is uh, socially acceptable to, to have this kind of support. And here, if, we go to the other phase and say that it's not good to do this kind of lower excise for, for households. It's, it's difficult to explain that uh, at, at uh, a large public. Uh, and I will be happy to, to have your view on that. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Olivier. And I think the last point was really also an important one. I know that from, from Germany that when you have surveys, if people are for more climate action, you have high like rates of people agreeing. But then if you have the same survey on like if they are on higher taxes, on excise taxes like, like fossil fuels, like gas line, they, they strongly disagree. So that is kind of the tension <laughs> we live in. So now we have, uh, before going to the panel discussion, we have around five minutes for questions specifically to Susanna and Olivier. I'll do it for the panel. So, um, yeah. So, if there are none specifically, we could move directly to. No, but I'll ask it for the panel. The question. Yeah. Okay. Then I ask. Um, um, yeah, Kaya to come up, and Ireland um, can. Yeah, uh, can ask a question. Um, say, for example, a, a fuel allowance where you pay a household. Um, some money so that they can keep warm um, or you reduce the, the price of a road fuel tax so that they can u use their vehicle. Um, it's a short term negative kind of measure. You would be much better to, to improve the energy efficiency of the dwelling you know, to make a capital improvement or to pay a subsidy to move to a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle. So by continuing to pay the, the short-term quick measures, you are slowing down the big transition. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the, I, I understood that, that that was more like a statement, <laughs> uh, which I agree. Um, so now we can move on to the panel. So we have, um, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to have uh, four experts in the field with me today. So we have uh, Kaya from uh, Statistics Estonia, then Isabel from Eurostat, Susanna from SCB from Statistics Sweden and Miriam from OECD. So um, the idea is that I have one introductory question for, for all of them, and then we have individual questions to make it, because, yeah, experts are a bit different from regarding where they come from. And for the quest question, it's a bit related to a question we got in the chat. So I ask, could you please read the question, and then I'll ask the first question, which are related to each other, and you could first answer them together. Thank you. So there is a generic question from the online audience. 
and it is um, who are the main users of information that you publish and disseminate, and more importantly, what kind of feedback or suggestions do you receive on improving the environmental taxes and, and subsidy statistics? Yeah, and related to that is also my first question, like from your personal experience, how is the information on fossil fuel subsidies and environmental taxes that you provide used by policymakers? And I start with Miriam, who has a lot of experience to work with policymakers. So. Thank you very much. Even so, I would not call myself an expert in this particular field, uh, but I, I work a lot on this and also on the policy use of this, uh, of, of this data. Um, well, the work we do in the OECD, and that was presented by Sarah uh, on the fossil fuel uh, support inventory, this work is directly linked uh, to the policy we, work we do with countries uh, to help them uh, assess uh, their support measures uh, to guide uh, fiscal reforms in countries. And we know also that in countries, these data are really uh, systematically used. A country that establishes a, a subsidy inventory establishes this inventory specifically for policy uses. Now, I think we have to, di to distinguish between the granular information that an inventory provides and the more limited information than you, that you can get from accounts or through some, some, some indicators or aggregated information that you can use for public communication purposes. I think there we have to be very careful. Uh, at national level, uh, it's always very straightforward to use whatever information, if you accompany it with information on the specific national context. For example, we, we discussed tax expenditure. You need, to, you need to know something about national uh, baseline rates. You need to know something about eligibility terms, market prices, uh, energy tariffs, emission rates, etc. When it comes to the international level, it's a little bit more complicated. We use this indicate and this data mainly when we work on specific country reviews, whether it's OECD reviews or uh, contributions to G20 reviews. For communication purposes, we also publish aggregates to attract attention to, as an input to press releases. Uh, it attracts attention, but it raises also concerns about interpretability, and we get these comments back uh, regularly. So I think it's, it, it's, these data are very important. The subsidy data have a closer link to policies than the tax data, but both are important to support uh, fiscal policy reforms. So it's, the link to policies is, is really evident. But we need to improve the data, we need to improve the international comparability and come up with a consensus uh, on how to do so. So maybe I'll stop here. Yeah. Yes, so uh, thank you. Yeah, and I totally agree. We need to improve the data and need to improve the link to policy. So the first question on how it's used by policymaker, as I said, we haven't published these results yet, but uh, we, we know there's a lot of interest. Of course, there's a lot of interest in the SDG indicator, and as already been mentioned, the NGOs are very interested in these, and they do their own calculations and publish their own reports. Uh, but also a lot of analysts uh, that contact us as a national statistical office, uh, they want to combine this information on uh, emission and pricing. They want to evaluate these taxes, uh, how effective has the carbon pricing tax scheme been in Sweden and so on. And I don't think that the demand on this will decrease. It will certainly increase uh, in the near future, given all these new policy measures uh, within climate uh, that we are facing for 2030. So uh, I think what's important when communicating this is uh, it, that it needs to be transparent, so what we are actually measuring and not measuring. And, and then there was a question on the main uses from the chat, or yeah, uh, and I think, or what they, they want, the, the users want, right? And I think the, the answer is more granularity, at least. They want microdata, they want to do, be able to do this analysis on a very detailed level, and I think just doing sort of split Putting these emissions into combustion-related emissions can actually help a lot for them to be able to do this analysis. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, at EU level, that's sure that we have as well some DG uh, policy DGs that are much interested with that, and especially as um, uh, Miriam mentioned, you know what is related to fiscal, fiscal uh, reform, so this uh, taxation uh, tax suit uh, DG that we have, and here I think as well the. When we go to more granular data, especially, let's say, which industries are our concern. So this is something as well where the, uh, the EU policymakers, some of the, you know, they, they may come up with some specific uh, reform on specific industries. So that's why some of this detail is quite uh, uh, key. Um, and then I think it has to be clearly identify what we what is the scope so that's at least you know you know what you measure you know what you don't measure and this is i think some transparency i think is really important as well for the for the users to to know what what they are looking at which data it is and of course that's why as well uh, Sometimes, you know, we, we need to do some uh, shortcuts and only focus on, uh, let's say, things that are comparable across country, at least it, at EU level, and we may miss, let's say, part of it, but uh, uh, it's as well, uh, let's say, a building a process. So I guess in five years' time, we may have more data, definitely, than today, hopefully. And, uh, and there is as well this uh, DG um, uh, Data Gap Initiative at an uh, international level. So here we see as well that climate change, you know, it's uh, the, key, the key word uh, for some years already. And definitely, we have to improve this uh, data gap that we have for the moment in, in this kind of policy areas. Thank you. Yeah, I could say uh, from a national perspective, um, uh, and uh, regarding the question on um, who, who is the user of this kind of statistics, um, mm, ecological tax reform was initiate, initiated in Estonia in 2005, and um, it was quite some time ago, and it has had its ups and downs, but already in the very beginning there was a question how to monitor the environmental, uh, ecological tax, it was ecological tax reform. And the main idea of this ecological tax reform was to uh, inc uh, uh, reduce, the, uh, uh, re reduce the taxes on labor and to, to, uh, uh, to increase the taxes on the resource uh, uh, input and um, uh, uh, the pollution uh, and statistical system uh, in st stats office was in the very beginning already with financial minister and environmental minister in this discussion how to how we, will we monitor when tax account even wasn't there at that moment but it was uh, for us it wasn't there so we started to uh, develop that one as one of the instruments and uh, of course in one hand you can see how the uh, uh, social taxes uh, uh, labor taxes are changing compared to uh, the share is compared to total taxes and how the environmental taxes share is changing compared to, to total taxes. So if you get this dynamics, this is already very useful in a general level for these ecological fiscal uh, reforms, but it's not all. So we also, uh, we were looking what are the criteria, what is available and then we found the OECD Guide for Policymakers 2011. Miriam knows, yeah. So this was, and this came up, came up with very kind of a clear, clear criteria what should be taken into account when uh, kind of designing these reforms, as you said, and what the environment taxes should be, so that they should be in one hand effective, and they should be, was it, they have to be fair, but it has to be very kind of this revenue neutrality, competitiveness, and equity, these are the aspects that should have been taken into account. And we all designed the set of statistics for for this. So we, when the environmental taxes account was designed, it's related to national accounts, so we could evaluate on the economic activity level. So how, for example, if you look at whether it's revenue neutral, you can on the activity level see how the taxes are increasing and how the activities revenues are increasing or decreasing. So what, what are these, uh, what, what are these kind of, uh, in absolute, you can look at this in absolute figures, but you can also look at uh, this in kind of in the shares, or you can look uh, in sense of effectiveness, you can judge whether uh, uh, by a certain 
uh, uh, for example, you have a certain tax, fuel excise duty, you can uh, check how in activities the fuel use has decreased or increased, or the taxes, or what is the share of the fuel use, fossil fuel use, and respective tax. And when you see that households and land transport are kind of uh, those who suffer the most, but there are other activities who use the fuel, but who, who do not pay that much, much of the taxes. And these kind of taxes are of interest uh, for, for those who design the policies and make the analysis. And in addition, you could do like, uh, you can have also, uh, you know, you can look at the changes as well. And you can attach, you know, this importance of the issue, meaning that the size of economic activity in sense of its environmental pressure, if you find this kind of a good proxy for that one, for example, total emissions, and to see, make an XY plot and see how in this amounts and excise XY plots these activities are moving. What are the, uh, how, how they, uh, what are the changes in time? So, I think uh, taxes account provides kind of a good basis uh, for this kind of an analysis. So I think it's, uh, it could be kind of useful. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya, for the, for the passionate statement. Um, and I think some of what you mentioned, we also saw in, in the presentation from Sweden, where you see that which, how, which sector is um, affected from the rates. So now I'll move on to more individual questions. Um, so I have one for Sweden and Eurostat specifically. So um, the question would be, what are, in your experience, pros and cons of effective carbon rates and data on fossil fuel subsidies, respectively, in the debate of adequate taxation of fossil fuels? So yeah, have you any experience? What do you prefer if you have to choose one? And, and yeah, what do you think? You can decide who deep <laughs> starts. Yeah, I think I already. Uh, sort of um, try to say that we, we prefer the, the ECRs uh, uh, because, I mean, there's a number of reasons for this, but first of all, they're very easy to understand. In most cases, they don't require any specific new data collection, so uh, at least, okay, not for most of it, so it's sort of an cost-efficient indicator also to, to produce if you have, of course, the environmental taxes and uh, the emission data on a quite detailed level. Um, but at the same time, subsidies also are, are, of course, interesting. And if you want to do specific analysis of policy shifts uh, or so on, on, like on a broader scale. Uh, so in, in the best of world, we would know more about these subsidies. I mean, we would have sort of perfect information. What's the purpose with them? What, why have they been introduced and what's their effect? But since we are lacking that, we still have to do some guessing or qualified guesses as a statistical office. Uh, so, as we talked about, I mean, each of these subsidies, the direct transfers that uh, we've discussed, or many of them, they can actually be both environmentally friendly or environmentally damaging, depending on which perspective that you're looking at. So, so that is also maybe a message to policymakers, uh, who are probably not present here in this room, to also be better at uh, doing their analysis of, of the, these subsidies uh, that they, they introduce. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah. In terms of the, the pros of the average effective carbon weight, I think indeed I can just echo what uh, Susanna said. So in terms of um, measurement, it looks a little bit easier because data is m most, uh, mostly uh, available. And you don't go into this uh, in terms of comparability between country. Uh, yeah, we, we, you don't need this. Uh, we don't have to to, to have this uh, benchmark things and so on. That may be a little bit uh, critical into comparison between between countries. In terms of um, uh, maybe cons as well for the fossil fuel subsidies, is that tax abatement or tax relief they are not really there somehow, at least in the for the moment that the definition we have taken. And of course there yeah, so we, we are missing something there. Uh, but it's quite it's not neither the, if I if I'm not mistaken, it's not neither yet, you know, fully in the CR central framework. So maybe it means that we have definitely to to work on, on this to um, 
to define and then to agree and then to, to see what would be the impact in terms of uh, policy for the policy makers. Yeah, thank you. I think especially what you wrote, uh, Susanna, is an interesting point when you have like subsidies like um, subsidies to electric cars, you can see it either as a subsidy to renewable like sources, but also it's still using energy. So it might be still energy um, or environmentally damaging, especially if the electricity is coming from like carbon sources. So and then now moving on to Estonia, and I have a specific question for you, Kaya. So um, in which aspects related to fossil fuel subsidies and the reporting of the effective carbon rates do we expect or wish more guidance from the CIA? Like where do you would like to have more guidance either from the CIA or even Eurostat as a, as a EU member? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, as, uh, as regards the effective carbon rates, this is something that we do not do. Uh, we, do not uh, we do not calculate lead, uh, yes, and we have had, had the discussion with the ministry what, is the, uh, what the effective, uh, effectiveness means. So uh, in which moment the uh, tax is effective and how it's, uh, what, uh, if um, a financial ministry uh, is in a dis discussion with a lobby group, so uh, what this effectiveness m means and what has to be taken into account. So this is, this is something which, is, um, uh, which has been still uh, open, so you can have it on mi a macro level, yeah, but, but what it means on a micro level and how, how it could be used in a policy. Uh, and uh, but the fossil fuel subsidies, we already, uh, we already talked, uh, discussed in the morning, but you, uh, you have these four categories. You have those, uh, those, uh, those streams which are uh, quite easily identified, first, uh, first kind of two main ones, and then uh, these, ad uh, these additional, uh, additional uh, kind of uh, indir uh, indirect, uh, in uh, indirect uh, issues. This is something what you, but has to be clarified. But as we do not uh, make these calculations, and uh, as this is not in our work stream, so uh, I, I'm not, uh, maybe someone is even could be better here to uh, maybe uh, uh, Claire from UNEP could be uh, kind of better to, to tell these, uh, kind of shed light on these issues, or Miriam. Thank you. Yeah, that also brings me to Miriam and um, one last question, but also you are, I'll have one last question for in the terms of the panel and then we open for the, for the audience. And also if you want to add something to the other questions, feel free. So my last question would be um, presenting tax reliefs as CO2 as subsidies may be popular, but how are we supposed to communicate these so-called subsidies when also um, the tax rates are increasing for emission-related taxes in the same countries. So often the abatements are, of course, related to high tax rates in general on fossil fuels. It's a bit related to what you said earlier, I think. Uh, I, th I think this, uh, this aspect of communication is very central, and we have already uh, started uh, to, to discuss this. Um, I think for communication purposes, uh, it is very important that we have uh, measures or indicators that are easy to interpret and there the effective carbon rates uh, come in and as uh, Susanna already said, I mean, uh, they have the advantage of being easy to understand, uh, of not being dependent on local conditions uh, and uh, to be uh, comparable uh, across countries. So for communication purposes, I really think we should use the effective carbon rates together with information on fossil fuel support, because the combined presentation can be very useful and provide very useful uh, insights. At the same time, I think we should work, uh, continue to work uh, with countries to make the national information on tax expenditure more comparable. Uh, trying to introduce this idea of using uh, reference benchmarks and reference prices into national work. Uh, this would be uh, very useful, not only for countries, but also uh, for international work, uh, with a link uh, to the work uh, done on effective carbon rates. So I think for communication purposes, always use the two together and use the effective carbon rates when it really comes to uh, cross-country comparison uh, with links to, 
to taxing actually the energies. Okay, thank you. I think yeah, that was a really concise and um, good statement for me also to um, to see what OECD thinks on this topic. So now we still actually have time since everybody was really brief. So if there are questions or statements from the audience, we, we would have time for that. Um, so France. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the useful uh, exchange. My, my question would be on uh, taxation and carbon taxation and uh, inequality. Because I think that the policy uh, issue that was raised by almost all of you is related to that question. We, we, when you make a graph uh, with the, the, the effective carbon tax rate, it should mean that the higher the tax rate, the better uh, your country uh, involved in, in environmental issue. And uh, if you if you compute this uh, statistics net of subsidies, then you uh, mean in a way that subsidies are like negative uh, taxation, uh, and uh, their purpose uh, are uh, precise uh, have precise goals. I mean, I mean, I'm come from the country of the yellow jacket movement strikes of six months because we would raise uh, the carbon tax by uh, 10 uh, euros a year. And uh, we start from uh, 70, if I correct you, correctly read the, the OECD uh, graphics. So for the economics, it's not much, but for people, uh, it's high. And I come also from the a country uh, of the uh, red hat movement which was a strike for a tax on a trucks, a kilometer tax. So what this strike says, they say that when you raise a carbon tax, the, and, and if you don't have subsidies policies, or if the taxes are not adjusted to the type of household, then you create a lot of inequality. To say it in a world when you, you put a tax on a car, poor people are not going to change their, their, their car. So I think that uh, I, maybe it's the case or it's in the plan of an international organization, but uh, distributional tables, as far as taxes are concerned, should be essential, or at least the Gini computation of uh, the tax system and the subsidies systems are crucial uh, for a policy maker to take good decision uh, uh, within uh, aggregate, uh, out uh, uh, in complement, sorry, uh, uh, for the aggregate uh, overall tax rate. Yeah, I think you touched upon an interesting and very important point. And Miriam, would you like to, as a most closely to policy makers? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, I think I think this question leads us to something that goes beyond the statistics and just the inventory data that we all could produce. Um, it leads us to how you actually approach a fiscal reform or a subsidy reform. Uh, the OECD recommends for this uh, a five-step approach, where you first identify the policy measures and their objectives. From that, uh, you uh, then assess the economic, environmental, and social uh, effects. Then third, you identify and prioritize the policy measures uh, that should be reformed. Then you assess the distributional effects uh, of the, re the reform that you would like to propose. Uh, identifying with the winners and losers. And ideally, on top of that, uh, you design alternative policies that would achieve the same objectives, but be more cost effective and having better environmental or social outcomes. So if you are able to follow this five step approach, we think this is a possibility to minimize political backlash 
may not work everywhere, but at least you can ensure that you have looked into the various aspects. Uh, so, so, so it is a policy process building on an information base that's granular enough to enable you get started. So that's from my side. Yeah, thank you. I think this, at least now we know how to do it in an ideal world. And let's hope that policymakers, they, they, they approach you and ask you for advice. Um, is there any comment from? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes, the, 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 I think the social aspects are, are uh, important. And this brings us to the, you know, to the main idea why environmental accounts account accounts have been implemented so that you con can connect these uh, uh, issues rela related, related to the environment or to national accounts and then also to the social statistics. And you have uh, the, something, if you have, you know, implement a new tax, then you can look at these, if you have this proper, uh, proper uh, kind of these accounts available. Also, uh, this, uh, this effect, uh, effect on household consumption. So you have this uh, and also there is an indicator, there is a, uh, uh, in income inequality. So the Gini, uh, Gini indicator of in income in in inequality, which shows how much the, the richest quintile of the population uh, earn, earns, uh, uh, earns more than the, uh, uh, the purest. So, so this is, uh, and uh, there are granular data behind, and when you have the household consumption by the, uh, you know, by the type of the consumption, so you can see how large is the uh, uh, expenditure on the fuels, for example, or living uh, out of the total basket. So the in information is there, the question is how to make it usable. So. Uh, and this is exactly what could here exactly statistical system could be useful in this modeling of the uh, impact of these changing taxes to the uh, to the people uh, living conditions. So I, th I think there is a work to be done, and, and the people in the in this room as well who deal with this kind of a modeling, and this exactly will be the next session's topic. Thank you. Thank you. Then there's Netherlands. for all these interesting presentations and discussions. Um, it gives indeed a nice overview of all the different approaches that are still out there and uh, all the issues with reference levels, etc., etc. Et but I think what I, th I see is that there are a lot of progress has been made also with convergence of uh, methodology. So that's very good to see. Uh, my question is the following. Um, what, could, uh, what role could the CS Central Framework play here? As you may know, um, in June of this year, there will be a discussion if we'll, there will be an update of the CS Central Framework, yes or no. And of course, this is a topic that maybe could be addressed there. And uh, at currently, uh, these kind of uh, environmental damaging subsidies are not part of the CS Central Framework, but of course, the scope maybe could be uh, extended in that regard. But of course, the discussion is there, is uh, there a role for a CS Central Framework here to play, or is this more about methodology, about implementation guidelines? So that's the question I would like to put to the panel. Thanks. Okay. To give you the start, I mean, from our perspective, uh, we think it is tremendously important that the CEA central framework is broadened to capture also the potentially environmentally damaging subsidies and to provide guidance to countries on how to do so. If, in addition, we could uh, bring in some practical guidance on how to use the granular inventory data in order to feed in such accounts, that would be an added value, and I think the work done by Eurostat uh, already uh, is a good starting point uh, for that. Uh, as an application, uh, effective carbon rates could also be integrated. It depends on whether the applications will be merged with the central framework or whether this will be a, a separate exercise. So priority to the PETs, I would say. Yeah. Yes, and I can only echo uh, what Miriam just said. Uh, we think it's also important uh, to broaden this, and as a statistical office, this also gives some more sort of status to the 
data collection and also possibilities to carry on the work and get more human resources and so on. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with what was said. So I think definitely we should try to incorporate as well this uh, bad spot on the CR central framework. It has really a high priority, let's say, on some political agenda as well. And of course, let's say, yeah, we, we, have, st we have started, you know, the work on guidance or methodology. So this is something that can be already reused uh, as a material. Okay, thank you. So I think this, um, yeah, yeah, you can talk to me as well. I just uh, want to add, Dr. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we talked about today about the, quite a lot about the fossil fuels, but there are, as paid some much wider uh, con uh, scope and the concept than just the fossil fuels. I uh, think it also in, uh, from a viewpoint of the CF frame, uh, central framework, it is important to cover also with other uh, uh, measures which are uh, in contradiction with the environmental goals. For example, the ones related to agriculture and uh, producer responsibility, and there are other issues to be covered as well. So, but I think it could be something for the future, future, future uh, sessions and future discussions. So we would like to contribute as well. We, in Estonia, state audit office made a, made a, a, a kind of analysis of uh, of these kind of measures, and and we have kind of given a task to move, move to this direction to start. Uh, uh, start taking a kind of mapping out and then in future also to uh, calculating these subsidies which are related to the activities which are in contradiction with environmental goals. So it's much wider than just the fossils. Just a reminder. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kaya. And I think that also gives us an outlook on the way forward where we have to work on and as well what you said on the that we really should um, see the CS central framework to, to get um, the content there extended and be more specific about fossil fuel subsidies um, and also include things like the effective carbon rates. So I think this was a really fruitful um, discussion, but also a super interesting session where I myself learned a lot. And I would like to, um, first of all, thank all the panelists here, but also all who participated actively and the presenters online. And uh, yeah, with that, I hand over to Michael. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and also thank you much, very much to all speakers and, and panelists. Uh, we have reached the, the end of our technical part uh, of, of our uh, morning session, so it's also a message for the interpreters. Thank you very much. So today we don't need to extend, at least not in the morning, so <laughs> you're released from now on. Thank you very much for, for interpretation. Um, yeah, I have two points. Uh, one point is directed towards Miriam. Uh, and to all of us, actually, because we have to get used to the fact that our work on SEA, environmental indicators, environmental statistics, circular economy, and so on and so on, has to continue soon without you, because uh, it's not a secret that you're going to retire later this year. So just for everyone, we have to get used to the fact that there will be a very important input, and a good friend and colleague will be missing from that perspective. And uh, I understand that you, from, I don't, I know you now for almost 20 years. I don't know, I think when was the first time when we met? And it was actually very funny yesterday, before you came, it was a group of us went to a restaurant and also Miriam came, but she came a bit later. So we used the opportunity to think about her legacy that she had. What can we say? And we said, we make it very short. Don't, don't worry, we, we will not speak long, but I just want to share an anecdote with you. Because I asked several people, are there any anecdotes that we can tell? And uh, what about the legacy of Miriam in, in all this work? We're not talking about the legacy now because this would fill the full afternoon session. So I think this is clear to us. But about the anecdotes, it was super hilarious yesterday because some people came up with anecdotes, but the best one she delivered herself when she came. <laughs> you have to imagine the situation. She comes half an hour late. The reason why she came late is because she was trying to keep the tough deadline that they gave for presenters to pre prepare the presentations. This deadline was two weeks ago. So <laughs> she finished it yesterday. I don't blame you for that. <laughs> but lesson learned, we have to give deadlines even two weeks earlier. Anyways, I'm not blaming you for that. But the fun part was actually she came stressed. 
said, Michael, I lost my badge. I don't know why she was stressed. <laughs> it's not a big deal if you lose your badge. No, sorry, just kidding. And the moment she said it, she opened her arms and everybody could see the badge because it was below the scarf. And we said, it's there. She looked down, where is it? So it took us some time to convince her the badge is actually there, calm down. So this is, this is one anecdote, a stressful situation that ended in a laughter. So this is like also one characteristic and character of you that, you know, we can't deal together in stressful situations, but it always ends with a laughter. It's, it's a combination of maybe work-life balance is the wrong expression for it, but you bring life into work. And this is, this is really a nice thing. A second anecdote, and then I stop, uh, also a stressful situation. Maybe you don't remember, Miriam. We met, I think, in 2004 in Vienna. So it was the time when the OECD premises uh, were under construction or there was something. OECD asked member states if they could host international meetings. And I was actually one of the first ones, I think, who offered to host a meeting. This was the um, inter interworking group on water statistics. I don't know the proper name, but... Um, so you were there, Alessandra was there, I think many of you were also there in this meeting. And of course I wanted uh, all the participants, so it was hosted by the Austrian Environment Agency uh, in those days in 2004-2005, and I was the one organizing it. And of course I wanted all the participants having a nice memory, not only about the substance there, but they organized also a very nice social event, we still had money for that, there was a nice dinner. Um, and they also organized music, and we danced, danced waltz together. Maybe you remember that. So this was the second stressful situation <laughs> I wanted to share with you. It, I'm the worst dancer you can imagine, but we danced together, and she also took it with laughter, she took it with humor. So just this kind of characteristics that I really like on you, Miriam. So I think also I can talk on behalf of the entire group here. This is what we really like. It's professionalism. It's humor, it's friendship, it's, it's taking things easy, even if it's stressful, and always coming to the point when it's necessary. So I personally do not really know how we can continue with that. It will be possible. Um, I know that you will have your future voluntary work. You said you will work a little bit in this uh, municipality. So we prefer, of course, to have you here instead of there, but this is a decision that has been taken. Um, yeah, I think this is all I wanted to say here, but on behalf of the group, thank you very much for everything, and we have prepared a little gift for you, because I already mentioned you will be missed here, but we want you not to, we want you also to miss us. <laughs> and this is what I have prepared for you, a vintage version of the SEA Central Framework. So this was the first published version of the, of the 2012. It's my personal exemplar, exemplary. Uh, but I think everybody in the group signed, wrote a little bit of dedications to you. So this is for you not to forget us, okay? Thank you very much for everything, Miriam. Kaya suggested to dance now. No, we don't dance. Miriam wants to say something. Ah, Miriam wants to say something. Sorry. I just, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I hate this. Uh, but at the same time, it's very nice. And I wanted to thank you all. I will definitely miss you. And I will miss also uh, the, uh, the different work streams, uh, to work on the different work streams. There are some projects that will continue. So I will probably try to follow a bit, uh, so not to say goodbye immediately, but at least to be available uh, if, if you need some just general comments. Uh, so, so I would be happy to continue to contribute. Uh, I think uh, we are a very nice group of people, uh, not only the accounting people, but also the statistics and information indicators people, and I have very much appreciated working with all of you and your predecessors of all these years. So thank you very much, and a special thanks to Michael. <laughs>
<laughs> set, make the setup, and then please come in front, everyone. And uh, then, of course, we have our lunch break, and I invite you to be back at 2.30 sharp, as usual. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah.